Denny Hines has always done things her own way. She's had success in France and Japan, where they love music that's a little different. But then again, Denny's mum, Marsha Hines, was hardly the standard model. She'd been the pregnant teenage star of the musical Hair, and then Queen of Pop. Denny, welcome to Talking Heads. Why, thank you, Peter. When you go out on stage, mm -hmm. you say you go into a quiet moment. Tell us about that. Take us on stage with you. It's, um, it's a moment of just, <laughs> please don't mess up moment. Um, and it usually, it, it, I talk to dead people. Um, I know that's weird, but you know, I put it this way, the living are trying to mess with me all the time. I'm yet to meet a dead person that's trying to get up all in my mix, all right? So So who do you select? Who are my the dead grandmother. Uh -huh. And I can't tell you what I'm thinking about when I'm singing, because I'm somewhere, I don't know where I am. But I just I always go to the bathroom, have a quiet moment, talk to my relatives and say, listen, I've got a gig tonight. If you're not doing anything, come down and help me not forget the words. I get the feeling that the stage is the place you most love to be. I was on a stage from utero. I was in my mother on a stage, so maybe... Oh, you were too. <laughs> I see what you mean. I don't, back in the hair days. Back in mean. the hair days. So I don't... Maybe it's that. And I've inherited it. My mother and my father are singers. So, I don't know. Can I say roughly how old you are? You can tell exactly, because black don't crack. <laughs> well, you're getting to... I am 39. I'll be 40 in September. OK. Now that we've got that out... Oh, I need a personal trainer. <laughs> Some great hairs that so. I'm not happy about. <laughs> um, I don't see them. Oh, no, no, you're not showing them. They're in the puff somewhere. Oh, they're not just random ones. I'm like, what are you doing here? Get out. Um, we all have those. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know about this age thing. I don't know about it. I think I'm still as mad as I was when I was 20. At 40, I still play Guitar Hero. Do you, do you feel musically better than you were? Maybe by 50, the voice will really be where it's supposed to be. Well, that's, that's what I had in mind, that you have a, a voice which is naturally soul, rhythm and blues, mm. even jazz. More so than pop, maybe. I hate pop. I'm a soul girl. I am a strict soul. Pop's dirty. Ugh, I don't like it. And, and people yeah. say you're pop, but I, I'm not pop. But you, I was, you were. No, well, I don't think I was what pop. What about the rock melons? Ain't No Sunshine, probably one of the biggest rhythm and blues songs. And when it's on the radio, well, I'm not pop because I don't get radio play. So I'm not Does popular. that bother you that you not don't get really. radio play? I just think that I'm in the wrong country, but it's all right. I, I say to my boyfriend, sometimes my head gets sore bashing up against that wall, but I will back it down. I will break it down. OK, so let's put our toes over the edge. Up, jump off. Straight. Lay up down. And up. Every big successful person on this planet has taken that leap. Ready. Up. Now hang straight. Legs up now. You have to take a chance to succeed in this world, and I think that's what I've done. More than highs and lows, I've done a lot of trapezing. I've jumped off some stupid things, but you know what? I've bloody landed on my feet each time. Forward, let go. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I always think of my glasses being half full rather than half empty. My grandmother made a call to my mother, or mum called Gran and said, you know, the baby's been born, and Gran said with her strong West Indian accent, well, what's the baby's name? And my grand, my mum said Don Yale, and my grandmother said, cha, it's too long, call her Dini. Really then I went to America to live with my grandmother in Boston, because mum was working in Russia at the time with Daly Wilson Big Band. To keep on I was probably between three and five when I returned back to Australia from being in Boston. And then we lived in Maruvery Road, North Bondi, and I loved that house. This is the house that I woke up in after coming back from the States. I don't actually remember the whole journey or anything like that. I just remember this house. Um, it's probably the best house that I've ever lived in because to me, I, I don't know, I really felt that this house and I had a connection. What do you do? Do you sing or anything? Oh, guys, you want Denny Tug. She's going to be a ballet dancer, aren't you? She's what so coy. Oh, she's she... very quiet, Charles. <laughs> My earliest memories are um, music. 
A lot of music always played in the house because I was breastfed on Stevie Wonder music, man. Stevie Wonder was playing in the background and it was the dun 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 And my mum, I was moving around in between her knees and she's like, don't do that, don't you dare do that, don't do that, you dirty old rat. So that's my first musical memory. There were two points that I think for, okay, ooh, my mum's not quite the same as other mums. The first one is mum's queen of pop win. I'm picking my nose and mum's getting the award. And that's when stuff started to click for me, I think, about kind of getting what Mum did, because that's when this tour bus and stuff used to show up. I used to say as a kid I was really lucky <laughs> until I like hit 13, 14, because my Mum had great taste in music and Mum was on it. She was on point. And then when it got to high school, <laughs> what I thought was great <laughs> wasn't so cool. Now, your grandmother... Yes. She was quite a lady. Yes, she was. Her name was Esmeralda McPherson. Esmeralda Trephine McPherson. Trephine. Mm. Now, es Esmeralda uh, was brought up in Jamaica, mm -hmm. moved to Boston, mm -hmm. and it was to Boston that you went as really an infant, mm -hmm. and she looked after you. And I basically had spent so much time away from my mother that when she picked me up in the airport, I had no idea who she was. <laughs> Who's that lady <laughs> over there? And I wanted my grandmother. Ma! And then I slept for two days with jet lag. And then my grandma came over about six months later because mum was like, she could tell mum was having, not struggling, but it was just a bit hard being on the road with a, you know, a six-year-old, five-year-old. And so Gran's like, well, look, I'll come over and help you look after. Dimi. When you stepped outside and went to school, mm -hmm. was it tough? Primary school, the teacher took my mother's, got my mum to sign a piece of paper and made a stencil of it and gave her signature out to the whole school. But it was only, I just say the first two years of um, high school were the weirdest ones for people being a bit strange. You know, I come to school on one certain, well, probably about the day before I left, in the quadrangle, quadrangle, the toilets there, Marsha and Denny Hines suck. <laughs> Dude, I'm just coming to school. So yeah, I left that school, then I got kicked out of the Catholic school that I went to. And then I went back to another public school and had a ball. So did you fight back with the bullying? Oh, I did come did to school with that? a pair of scissors one particular day, yes to have to stand up against some biatch if she really wanted to go there, because I am West Indian. After all, I can fight if I have to. What about at home? How do you push the boundaries at home? I thought my mother was related to the devil when I was a kid. I thought they were like brother and sister, because I couldn't do anything. The day that I went to school in a short skirt because it was just better, because the long ones are daggy, and mum comes to school, she takes me to the classroom and she makes me change my skirt in front of the class. Holy gamoly. Hello. See what you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it worked. I never wore that short skirt again. Mum didn't know I was singing, you know. Mum didn't know that I was touring with Wawani until um, I used to drive down to Melbourne. I'd do school Monday to Friday and then I'd get in a car with the boys and drive down to Melbourne, do a show in Melbourne on a Saturday night, turn around on Sunday, come back home, go to school on the Monday. This is also true about modelling, isn't it? That, yeah, that you took up modelling and she didn't her. know. Uh, I can't easily fathom that. Oh, well, my stuff was in Japan. <laughs> How's she gonna know? How did it come about? I walked into an agency with a girlfriend of mine um, who was signed to the agency and um, they asked me if I'd like to consider being a model. I went, oh, okay. I never really thought of myself as a model. I like food. <laughs> my grand knew. As long as one of you knew. That's all that matters. Ain't no sunshine when he's gone. I met the Rockmelons through Ronnie Laster and Tony Cook, who were James Brown's musicians, but I met them through the Rockmelons. And the Rockmelons had actually supported James Brown maybe five months, six months prior to that. And they had a singer called John Kenny, who sang New Groove, who at that stage had acquired nodules on his vocal cords, so he couldn't actually demo any of the songs. And I got a call saying, would you um, be able to come down and demo some stuff for us because uh, our singer's got nodules? And I said, yes. And I said, you know, there's a song that I think you guys should do. And I sang like a little bit of Ain't No Sunshine. And something happened where they, I think they, were, they liked what they heard. And then the next thing you know, I was in the studio demoing that. 
was actually Triple J Radio that played it the first time. And we, in my house, we had a little radio in the kitchen. And I remember I was cooking breakfast one morning and Ain't No Sunshine came on. And I remember I frantically shook the tape machine thinking, I haven't left the demo in here. Oh my God, it's on the radio for the first time. And I ran and got Gran and got Mum and stood there and listened to it for the first time. And that was a bit of a... It's, it's all right, Denny Hines. I got an aria for It's All Right for that single. I didn't know. I knew I would... Oh, look, thanks. And grouse. Grouse. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Arias are great, but I want a Grammy. No, straight up, I do, I, I do. Well, actually, when I got my Aria, that's probably when I said, well, you know what, Mum didn't help me get that, and she didn't help me sell 1.2 million records either. That's when I realised I've got my own musical identity. Well, that's really grouse. It is grouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I get my Grammy, because that's what I've really come here to get, um, I will probably say something a little deeper than grouse. <laughs> you fell into modelling. Yeah. In a way... I fell into singing. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. You fell into singing too. I wanted to be a coroner. A coroner, yes. Yes, I did work experience A forensic in psychologist yeah. coroner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Mum wanted to be a mortician. <laughs> Truly? Yeah. Singing coroner. I think there's a career <laughs> there. Singing coroner. <laughs> It's interesting what you say about your mum, that obviously your growing up is about you finding your own space, mm -hmm. your own, who you are, separate from your mum. Mm -hmm. I used to say at the beginning, like, if my mum was an orthodontist and I became a dentist, would there be this much interest? <laughs> well, in the dental profession, maybe. <laughs> you know, like, would people care? But um, I also think it's a pretty, it's kind of special thing that, you know, for a certain amount of time in the Australian history, you've got two artists who that are related, mother and daughter, doing what they do. You've always done the full immersion stuff, like the musical scene. Uh, you get to know Michael Hutchins, not surprising, in excess. Then you marry Kirk Pengilly, sax player, guitarist from in excess. When you, when you think back on the marriage, and it was short. Yeah. A year or something. 18 but... months, thank you. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> it's 1.5 times as long. <laughs> it looks better on paper, 18 months, yes, you know. <laughs> What, what do you think you were doing? What was going on as you look back on that? Oh, you know what I was doing? I was looking... I, I married a man who was four years younger than my mother. Who was looking for her father? Indirect... I seriously look at that and go, what, what were you thinking, Heinz? What about your dad? What about him? Well, that's... Can you see the disdain on my face? What about that loser? I call him the donor. Please don't call him a dad, because he's not one. At one stage as you were growing up, you thought you'd go and meet him. Well, I tell you, the long... The, I remember he called me and said he was going to come out for Christmas, but he has spoken to me three times since then, last year, and he said, well, you know, you call, I called you and you said it's my birthday, I can't talk, and I went, I'm five. I don't know you, and if I've got the choice of eating lollies or talking to a stranger on the phone, what do you think the five-year-old's going to do? The next time I hear from him, 1998? Not even him, his wife. I was in London. This woman calls me up out of nowhere and says, Hello, I'm Debbie. I'm your, um, your father's wife. And I'm just gone, T -t -t Debbie, father, what? What? Flash forward to last year. I get a message on MySpace from an 11-year-old who is the, the son of the donor. He's got four children to four different women on three different continents. I've got a 24-year-old stepbrother who shot at his girlfriend but missed. Uh -huh. Do I want to be related to these people? When you, when you talk about him, you obviously feel... I don't like him. Well, that's obvious. I had one or two phone conversations with the donor. Thought, you know what, y your job is done. Thank you, or goodbye. Wrote this brilliant song called Feel. Sent it to him on an email. That was my last bit of correspondence. And that's my only correspondence I've had with this man, and I don't really want any more. The only boy who could ever reach me was the son of a 
I got the call to play a crazy lesbian, Dusty Springfield's lover, in Dusty, um, in January 2005. Then when you finally got the hair and the wig, oh, OK, that makes sense now, I get it. But um, it's very exciting. Dusty was a different musical because I actually had a lot of dialogue and it was really pushing me outside my uh, comfort zone. Yeah. I think she's absolutely the right choice. What am I going to wear? Fabulous. You see the difference? Mm. I think I've got the first scene in, um, in my head, maybe. Don't know. And I remember the first day Tamsin and I had to get together and kiss, and all I can say is I'm glad she came to me because there's no way I was going to her. I learned from Tammy that one must be very serious when one is with lesbian, and it's hard for me to be serious. I'll be serious when I'm dead. I was surrounded by a wicked cast. They were all proper actors and they studied it. They'd all come from Whopper. I'd come from Aria. When I was doing the musical, Dusty, I started listening to all this old music from back in the day. When I first heard someone to watch over me, I was like, my God, that's such a haunting song and it's so beautiful. There's a saying on says that love is blind. Next thing you know, I got a meeting with James Morrison. If you had sat down with me even 18 months before that and said, Jenny, you're going to do a jazz album with James Morrison, I would have laughed you out of the cafe. Because I was like, I can't sing jazz. What are you talking about? I pff, don't know any jazz songs. There's a somebody I'm longing to see. <laughs> Working with James Morrison was just one of the most amazing experiences of my career thus far. That man is a freak with a capital F. He plays everything. He plays double bass, plays drums. Trumpet is what we know him for, but if you listen to our album, I mean, he's playing piano. And it's just musical heaven. You seem very much at home with those classics. Do I? Oh, I'm not. You should step inside. I don't well, know. how do you feel? Scared. Don't mess up, Heinz. The one woman that I love and I tried to mimic, not mimic, I tried to take her essence into the way I sang the songs was Ella Fitzgerald. The way that that woman uses her voice like an instrument. Someone to watch over me whenever I always sing with my eyes closed and when I sing that it's a street light, it's like a London street light and it's, it's just a froggy light in like by the Thames. That takes you to the mood. I've had one experience very early singing where this is where you want to open my eyes. I was watching myself sing, and when I realised I was watching myself sing, I closed and I freaked out and bang, opened my eyes again, and I had like a little watch myself sing for a moment, and then freaked myself out and got right back in my body and went, <laughs> no, don't do that again, that's not cool. Yeah, that's an interesting place to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a tripper, I think it's the acid. Mum took in when I was in her. So there's nothing I can do to outdo what my mum has done. As I a forgot what I was going to ask religion. you next. <laughs> we go, we're going good, I know what I was going to ask no. you about. Um, you're really flexible, you know. When Dusty came along, that must have been a big call that you'd take that on. I like acting. I've now done a movie. I want to do more of it. But when I did Dusty, I wanted people to be able to see me but not see me. And I had some friends come to the Melbourne shows. They rang me up incredibly annoyed because they said, you weren't on tonight. And I said, oh, darling, yes, I was. So that was perfect for you, was it? Yes. You'd, you'd, taken, you'd had success with singles in France and Japan, and they're interesting musical markets. Mm. Richard Branson, actually, talking about the virgin music industry, yeah. says that uh, Japan and France aren't in the mainstream at all. They have their own separate thing. And you've been, you've been successful in both markets. Yes, I'm quite happy about that. I broke into the domestic market in Japan with... Um, I wrote a t song for a TV show, and I think it aired, like, every... every night, like, a Neighbours. But I also had the number one album in Japan. So um, Japan really quite surprised me, because I don't look like them. 
they don't look like me, but they like me. That's cool. And it's a great market because once they got you, they've got you. The beautiful, absolutely most beautiful, Denny Hines. I'm a Virgo and we're perfectionists. And when I step on stage, basically that's it. I'm ready to go to work. I'm ready to battle. Let's do this. Once the room's got people in it, it sounds different. And there's a dynamic that happens on stage with the band where we get excited. All my senses are open when I'm listening to everything that's going on. First song, first three minutes, taking everything in. By second, I'm on a home run. I'm in the suite. I'm singing. I'm having fun. Rain just fall against my naked body. I think I'm here in a summer that we met. But I love singing. I love it sick. I just love the freedom of it. I just love that I don't do many things well, but damn it, I do that well. I feel you can't tell you what's going through my head. It's probably the time when my mind is most quiet. There are moments on that stage where it's just like, oh, no, you didn't. You didn't just play that line. Like, the bass drums will hit something, or the bass player will do some guitars, and you just go, oh, my God, that's really better than sex. Nearly. Not quite. I tell ya, no, I was watching Deepak Chopra on the telly this morning and he said something and I was like, he's on it. When you love what you do and you laugh a lot, it makes you stay younger. Now, this is, a, this is I, I have a problem with this. Woo, in five months' time, woo, goodbye 30, hello 40. I do talk between songs, and sometimes it might be about the song I'm about to sing. I'll always be my mother's daughter, but I've, I've got work to prove to, to stand next to my name now. It's just not because of the lineage or through a name. I don't know if I've found my identity yet. I think I'd like to say I'm still finding it. Let's have a talk to me at 39 and let's sit down again with me at 59 and say, oh, girlfriend, you had no idea. You thought you did, but you don't. So I don't know. I'll just enjoy the ride until the ride stops. You're not just a singer. You've got a real social conscience too. Yes. And uh, among issues you have looked at and are really concerned about are homeless. Mm young men and women. Yeah. And Africa too. Africa was an you amazing... You went to Nairobi. Yes. What did you find there? And, and you went with a, an organisation called Oasis Africa. Mm -hmm. I am an ambassador for an organisation, Oasis, and we have a school in a place called Kibera, and it's the biggest slum in Africa, 1.2 million people. And we have a school in there with 1,260 children. So they, they introduce you into school, you have to sing and dance, and they sing to you, well, education, this is... It's just... So sweet. And I ended up coming home, falling in love with this boy, and I'm sponsoring him. Interesting things about you and your values. I mean, you had a run-in with the RSPCA. Oh, huge. I went and did this thing for the RSPCA. Well, you're a vegetarian. Yes. They had dead cow on the table. But they also had a woman talking about how she went to the RSPCA, RSPCA and she got her pet cow and he was just so lovely and her life had changed. This is for the animals. Don't be saying we're here to save them and then yamming down a cow at the next moment, because that's not right. Be vegetarian for two hours. It's not going to kill you. What are you going to do in the next few years? Go postal. No, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to go on learning, of course. Yeah, that's, that's what that's, life that's is really, about, That's I really think. important to you. Mm. So, so how do you go, someone at your age and stage, what do you do to go on learning? My trip to Africa was just mind-blowing for me. Just different time signatures, different rhythm beats that are totally different from the R&B world, totally from, different from what's going on in Australia. Middle East, half the quarter tones that they, yeah, baby, yeah, baby, all that kind of stuff. I want to learn those notes because our ears aren't tuned to those things. And So producers out there, take note. Take note. If you want some crazy zany black chick, here I am. <laughs> it's been great talking to you. Thank you. You're a lovely man. You are going to go far. <laughs> We'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks, man. See ya. You're gorgeous. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry, bit of leg, ABC. Sorry. <laughs>